In the workshop, a solution to the overheating ash pan. If you've been watching the three-part series about the steam test of the Castle Steam V6 boiler, you will have seen what happened in episode 3, where the ash pan burnt the wooden base. And when I say burnt, I mean really burnt. The nice wooden base that I put together was reduced to charcoal, so I cannot mount this cast iron ring straight down onto a piece of wood because it's going to cremate it. I never had this problem with my other 6 inch diameter coal fired boiler and that's because the main base of the boiler was lifted off the baseboard with some spacers and this allows some air underneath the ash pan and base assembly so it doesn't overheat. In this clip I'm taking out the allen cap head bolts or screws or whatever you want to call them that hold the ash pan to the cast iron ring. This part of the job at least was successful. The allen cap head bolts hold the ash pan firmly to the cast iron ring but then it goes downhill from there. There is a tremendous amount of heat in this ash pan, as you can see by the distortion and the discoloration of the stainless steel. One idea that I had, very briefly, was to make a tank that sits underneath the ash pan, a very slim, silver-soldered, thick-gauge copper tank. And this could be a water tank, and it could be connected to the main boiler, so the heat of the residue in the ash pan would also boil the water in the base tank. But on the grounds of unnecessary complexity, I abandoned this idea. This is a view of the top surface of the cast iron ring, and I was quite surprised to find that the paint was still on there, a little bit cracked and crazed, but still basically intact. And it wasn't heat resistant paint in the first place. Before scraping off the paint, which I'm going to do shortly, I need to mark the position for an extra mounting hole. I measure the distance between the centres of the two existing holes. Then I use the other ruler at 90 degrees to the first one to scribe a mark on the piece of metal. And in this part of the clip I'm checking the distance that the holes are from the edge of the inner ring. In retrospect it would have been better to use a ruler and a T-square or a set square. But over the years my eyeball is definitely locked into a 90 degree angle. So I just mark the position for the hole, drill the hole and here I'm threading it using a tap. This is the same M6 tap that I use for the other holes. Over now to my small boxwood lathe and I need to make the spacers. And in this clip I'm facing the end of the bar just to square it off. The piece of steel bar is quite a long way out in the chuck. But this boxwood lathe is in quite good condition for its age so it's not a problem. First of all I take a rough cut and now a fine cut. And in no time at all the end of the bar is at a perfect 90 degrees. The first part was in real time and now this is speeded up. And here we go, mass production. There are six of these to make. And the process starts with a centre drill followed by a twist drill. This is a quarter of an inch diameter twist drill and I'm drilling the hole in the piece of bar just over one inch. Then I apply some oil to the work and using a parting tool, part it off. It's not a good idea to drill too far down a piece of bar like this because the drill will wander. Only drill about an inch at a time. Then, if the hole in the centre, once you've parted off, still looks OK and it's still very central, you can use that as a guide for another one inch length of drilling. But if you need the component to be really accurate, re-centre drill every time. But these are not required to be high precision parts. They are, after all, only feet that the boiler is going to rest on. Nevertheless, they still need to be well made. It's also important on a small lathe, particularly using a very small parting tool, to reface the work before continuing. Smaller parting tools can wander about a bit. I could machine both ends of the piece of bar once it's parted off, but I prefer to do it this way. The centre hole was still accurate, so I used it as a guide for the drill to drill the second hole, again to a depth of just over one inch. I can use the part that I've already made to get the right position for the parting tool to part off the second piece, which is what I'm doing on screen at the moment. This is a high speed steel parting tool, so lubrication is important. I use my steam oil mixture which seems to work very well. I now definitely need to use a centre drill because I've had to pull the piece of steel out of the chuck in order to machine the next two parts. So as usual, centre drill first, then twist drill, drilling down into the work just over one inch. Making parts like this can get really tedious. That's the good thing about CNC, you can just set it going and it does it. But I don't have any of that, I have to wind the handle. Once I'd made six of these feet, I put them back in the chuck. I'm using a piece of brass strip to get them in the right position, and I machine the cut end. And I need to do this with all six of the feet, and that way they will all end up the same length. 
Here's the second place, and once again I use the brass strip to position the part in the correct place. I've locked the saddle in place on the bed so it can't move, so the cutting tool can only move from front to back, and eventually all six of these will be exactly the same length. And the best way to check the length finally is to put them on the lathe bed and run your finger across the top. But if you're a proper model engineer, use a digital caliper or a micrometer. Here are the parts placed loosely in position and you get the idea. But it looks a bit plain. I need a little bit of art in the job. What I'm doing here is cutting a groove in each of the feet using a round nose tool. The piece of metal is in the chuck and it's supported by a live centre. The tailstock and the tailstock quill are both clamped in place. So it makes it really simple just to take the part out of the chuck once it's been machined and fit the next piece and machine that. All you have to remember is the position of the cross slide and make a note of the number. That way the groove will be the same depth on every component. Really I should use some lubricant on this, in fact if I had it I would use coolant but it's very messy. For the purposes of the video though I'm cutting it dry. This is a very sharp round nose tool because I've just sharpened it. And while I think about sharpening lathe tools, this is a carbide tip tool and I use my green grit wheel for this. You cannot use an ordinary grinding wheel, they need to be green. So finally, my mass production extravaganza draws to a conclusion. Just in case you're wondering, I didn't machine the groove in the centre on purpose. That's why, when the parts are mounted, they look like they do. And as you can see from this clip, even though it's upside down, the thicker part of the feet are at the bottom. The final machining job is just to counterbore these to allow the fitting of these Allen caphead bolts. And these are the only Allen caphead bolts I currently have. I need to get some longer ones, which will go through the baseboard. But I'll do that before I put the whole assembly back together. Here's a top tip that I use a lot. I don't want to counterbore too far down this component. I could just look at the dial on the tailstock, but this is much easier. I draw a line on the twist drill itself using a felt tip pen, and then only introduce the twist drill into the work to that depth. And finally, when they're all done, I can tighten them in place. And if I mount the feet this way, there's another option open to me. I could put some ceramic insulators between the feet and the wood. Although the heat would be still transferred by the bolt, it wouldn't be much. I'm going to be painting the cast iron ring in the feet with some heat resistant paint. But for the moment, the base looks like this. And that's it for this episode. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.